We want to welcome you to our Sunday service. Uh, we're still on our Easter special that during the month of April. Uh, this is our early service uh, coming to you through the uh, internet, and we're thankful to ha have you, uh, both uh, those members of our church as well as others that are visiting and uh, around the world uh, with the internet. Uh, what we have done uh, during this April uh, study on Sundays is we've been looking at the Messianic prophecies involving four Jewish holidays, Messianic holidays, that deal with the first coming of Christ. There are seven major hide, uh, holidays, Messianic holidays. Four of them uh, deal with the first coming, and the last three deal with, and you can find these in Leviticus 23, deal with the second coming of Christ. Now, what's interesting about the first four is how they're interconnected. They're all part of one system of fulfillment. It's going to start with Passover on Nisan the 14th. That's one, that's one day, and it's, day, it's based on a date, not a day. Nisan 14, that's Passover. That's Exodus 12, where the death angel passed over, and those who had the blood of Christ on the, over their home, the door of their home, were spared. We, we've studied that. Uh, Passover. Then the next seven days is called unleavened bread. The first day, the 15th of Nisan, and the last day of Nisan, the 21st, are holy holidays. They're holy convocations. They're viewed as Sabbaths. John 19.31 called them high Sabbaths because they were viewed as uh, by rules and regulations of the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, applied to them, but they weren't weekly. They weren't the weekly Sabbath. Now, in the middle of the, in the, middle of the unleavened bread, there is a weekly Sabbath. Whenever that occurred, that's a day weekly Sabbath, Saturday, that's a day, not a date. It's really important you get that information in your head. When that occurs, that's called first fruits. That's the festival of first fruits. That's the first fruits of the, of the harvest that's coming. That's the first fruits of the harvest. You start counting from first fruits seven complete Sabbaths. And on the 50th day, that's 49, on the 50th day, was the gathering of the harvest. It was called the weeks, the feast of weeks, seven weeks. And that day we call Pentecost. We call it Pentecost. It was called by the Jews, they called it the feast of weeks. We call it Pentecost. The church of Jesus Christ calls it Pentecost. We don't call it the feast of weeks. The Bible doesn't call it that. Once that Pentecost comes once that feast of week on the 50th day in 30 AD. Uh, once it comes, its name is changed forever. And a lot of times we miss this information. So we've got Passover. We've got unleavened bread in the middle, somewhere in the middle, the day after the weekly Sabbath, the first day of the week, Sunday. We call it Sunday. Sunday they call it the first day of the week. From there, you count down seven Sabbaths to the 50th day. The word 50th means Pentecost in the Greek. That's where we got it. And today, what we're going to do is we, we've looked at Passover. We've looked at unleavened bread. We've looked at the, the first fruits. Now we're looking at Pentecost. Remember that all of these have their, their messianic prophecies that need to be fulfilled to the letter of uh, the word. Whatever Passover was about, Jesus had to fulfill it. Unleavened bread, Jesus had to fulfill it. First fruits, Jesus had to fulfill it. Pentecost, Jesus has to fulfill it. These are Jewish messianic holidays, all connected with the first coming of Christ and all connected with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection from the dead, and then Pentecost. And what we're discussing today is Pentecost. Now, Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. How do I deal with it? 
Well, 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my personal sin, it could be mental attitude types, it could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. If I confess my sins, God is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That cleansing for the Christian goes back to verse 7, where it all began, and that was on the cross. Christ shed his blood for the remission of sin. Not only, the forg not only forgiveness, but removal. Judicial, the judicial charges of Adam's sin are no longer applied to you. Now, why do I confess my sin, and why does God forgive me and cleanse me? He forgives me and cleanse me because of the work of Christ on the cross, because I belong to Christ. I belong to the family of God. This is a family affair. Personal sin is a family affair. So when I confess my sins, I'm forgiven, I'm cleansed, I'm not going to be disciplined by the Father for corrective behavior because I've corrected it myself. I've confessed my sin. And as a result of that, I now am restored to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now I can be spiritual. It's essential that you're spiritual under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. When you study the Word of God, not just when you learn it, but when you live it. It's got to be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit has been sent to us in the church age to teach and recall the word of God from our life, not just to it, but from it. So I'm going to give us a moment of that to reflect upon your own life as a believer priest. First Peter 2, 5 and 9, we're all believer priests. And as a priest, it's your responsibility to confess sin and stay in fellowship with God so they can direct your life according to the plan of God to the, to, the, uh, to the emergency of the hour in which you live of every day. So let's pray. I give you this moment of silence. Now, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way uh, by the Internet. What a wonderful tool this is, Father, for us. We're equipped, Father, to send this message as far as uh, you would see fit to have it go. It's a touch positive volition in a specific way to bring them back to the study of the word of God. Because the, the basic line of importance to every believer's life is what does the Bible say? What's the Bible? We're in a crisis right now, COVID-19. What does the Bible say? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say about disease and death? Well, basically, it comes from Adam's sin. It wasn't, there wasn't no disease and death in the garden. It was only after the sin and, exp and, and, and being expelled from the garden. And the blood of Christ takes care of both of these in the believer's life. It takes, it takes com complete control of it. So, Father, encourage our hearts today in the study of Pentecost, the, the final of the, the four great holidays that are prophetic of Messiah that he must fulfill. We look at it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'll open your Bibles with me today to Acts, the second chapter, let me show you some things. I'm just going to read four verses uh, for today's lesson. And when the day of Pentecost had come. Now, I want you to say that they called it the day of Pentecost. Actually, what the Jews called it was the Feast of Weeks. There's nowhere that's mentioned. And I'm going to tell you why in a moment. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues, i.e. languages, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. What a marginal, this has never happened. Now, they've had Pentecost ever since Leviticus 23. Ever since they came out of Egypt, they have had Pentecost. It's part of that four-section that four holiday, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, over to Pentecost. They didn't call it Pentecost. They called it the Feast of the Weeks. 
We call it Pentecost. The church of Jesus Christ calls it Pentecost. It's a doctrinal term, by the way, for the church. It's a doctrinal term. Well, we know that Passover on the 14th of Nisan in 30 AD was on a Wednesday. We know it from the, from the Sunday that he was raised from the dead. We know that Passover in Nisan 14 was on a Wednesday. We know he was buried. If you, if you have any doubt about this, go back and look. This is, we're in lesson four. Go back and look at lesson one, two, and three. If you have any questions about it. He was buried uh, during unleavened bread from the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th. That'd be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And he was raised from the dead. The tomb was empty on Sunday called first fruits of the unleavened bread. That would be nice in 18. Remember, unleavened bread went from 15 to 21. Dates, not days. It is very important when we study these this lesson today, that you go back and look at the previous lessons because Passover went to unleavened bread. Unleavened bread went to first fruits. First fruits goes to Pentecost. You've got to be able to connect all of them scripturally. Don't be a lazy. Don't be lazy. It's all been laid out for you. At least you can study. Now, in Acts 2, we have the fulfillment of the Feast of Weeks by Jesus Christ. Listen to me who is seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. Passover, he's on, the, he's on the cross on the hill of Golgotha. 15, 16, and 17, he's in Sheol for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. On the 18th and 19th, he's out. And while we count the, fe count the weeks, the feast of weeks, the next 50 days, 40 of those 50 days, Jesus is, is in his resurrection body appearing in Israel for 40 days, teaching his disciples. On the fourth day, he ascends, Acts, the first chapter, 9 through 11. He ascends back to the Father. And on the 50th day, Pentecost, he baptizes those believers at Pentecost at the Feast of the Weeks. He baptizes them as he said he would, as John the Baptist said he would, with the Holy Spirit. And he did it to the Jews in foreign languages called tongues. the manifestation of that baptism. People are so screwy about this idea. They don't pay attention to the significance of the history that lays out. Pentecost is the Feast of Weeks. It is the fulfillment. It is Christ fulfilling the, the and he does it from seated in heaven, not on earth. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruit. All of that, Jesus is on earth. He's either on it or under it. But at Pentecost, there's a new day. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And he issues in Pentecost. He fulfills Pentecost connected with the first advent. He connects it from heaven. He fulfills it from heaven. Now, that's a missing link in all the studies about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in tongues. All of that is missing from the Messianic history. And it shouldn't be. That's vitally important. I want you to go with me to Ephesians to see Jesus. Where, where is he and how is he going to do this Pentecost business? Well, here we are in Ephesians. I'm looking at Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 20, 21, 22, and 23. Now, verse 20, the word is seated. In verse 21, it's, it's supreme authority. In, in verse, 
uh, 22 and 23, we're looking at the Savior in heaven. The guy who died on the cross was buried and raised from the dead and ascended on the 40th day back to be seated in order to fulfill his responsibility at, Pente at the Feast of Weeks called Pentecost. Now, here's how this reads. Let me get to verse 20. Which he brought about in Christ, they're talking about the surpassing greatness of the power of God in those who believe, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand. Raised him from the dead, first fruits, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Forty days, forty days headed to Pentecost, he left earth and went back and was seated at the right hand of God the Father. Seated. Seated at his right hand in the heavens, heavenly places. Now watch this, verse 21. Supreme authority. Far above, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. All right? That's seated on a throne in the first coming, seated on the throne in the second coming is millennium. Supreme authority. Jesus Christ is seated with supreme authority. And the first act of supreme authority to the earth he who has all authority and power, the first act was Pentecost. But think about that. Verse 22, 23. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him, watch this now, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So what we have is a seed, the Savior seated does the first act of authority at Pentecost that involves him being the Savior of the church, and it is the church body that is the target. Did you get that? All things were put in subsection under his feet, and he gave him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You want to know why Pentecost? You want to know why the baptism of the Holy Spirit, by Je Jesus baptizing with the Spirit, and why you have tongues, is the fulfillment of the Feast of Weeks to the Jews to show that the person who died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead, is still in authority now as the Savior and the head, the Savior and the head of the body of Christ, the church in the world, and it began at Pentecost. People go like, where do you get the idea that the church began at Pentecost? I'm going to tell you, without any doubt, without any doubt, and you know what he sets there to do? To the church of Jesus Christ that began at Pentecost. He fills all in all. He fills all with all. How is it that you don't understand that your needs, the only need you need in this life is Christ? And all your needs in him are taken care of. Think about that. See, you miss little things in the Bible like the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's topping it out. That's not a little bit. That's a lot. <laughs> Ephesians 5.18. Now, let's talk in the time we have left, let's get down to business and talk about what I've just established as a truth. Let me lay it out and establish it. 
the Feast of Weeks, is now called Pentecost. It is the final Messianic prophetic holiday, Jewish holiday associated with the first advent of Christ, and it began with his crucifixion, Passover. There it goes, from Passover to unleavened bread to first fruits to Pentecost. There's the sequence. Jesus Christ must die, the sacrificial lamb of God, for the sins of the world, John 1.29, 1 Peter 1.18 and 19, 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. To bring us to God. Earlier, to the disciples, Jesus tried to tell them this. They wouldn't listen. In John 14, 6, no man can come to the Father except through me. Why? Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man. This is what is being declared by Peter in 1 Peter 3, 18. Paul declared it in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 when he said, Christ is our Passover sacrifice. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Has been. That's completed action over and up. Done. When was that done? When Jesus said in John 19, it is finished. In verse 30, it is finished. It is finished. This required Jesus fulfilling three Messianic holidays, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and there's still one to come. Now, here's my second point. It was called the Feast of Weeks because you counted seven weekly Sabbaths to get to the 50th day. Pentecost is the Greek word for 50th. The 50th day had a technical term called the Feast of the Harvest, the completion of what had been started with first fruits, where they waved the sheath, where the, the season began is now at the end, where the season began is now at the end. The first has now become the completed harvest. This is how it was understood. You can read about this in Leviticus 23, 23. The Feast of Weeks occurred in the third month of the Jewish calendar, Savin. That is a lunar calendar. Nisan was the first month of the Jewish year because of the Exodus. Pentecost occurred in the third month. It was at the end of of the harvest season. It was the ingathering of the harvest. Pentecost is the ingathering of the harvest of Christ our Savior. Pentecost. We live in the ingathering period. We live in the church age. The church age is the ingathering, it is believers sharing the gospel with every person who will listen, that they might be gathered in for the final harvest. When Christ returns, that final harvest will be over, called the rapture. Because the feast of the weeks in 30 A.D., because of the feast in 30 A.D. in Acts 2, the new covenant doctrinal name for this in the church age became Pentecost. It is a doctrinal term used under the new covenant for the feast of weeks in the church age in the period of the ingathering, the great harvest. Oh, please get this. Please get this. Let me show you something. Let's go back to Acts, the second chapter, and verse 
one. Let's do this. It won't take a moment. Let's just go back. Luke is writing. You know, he, he writes the book of Acts, and then he, I mean, he writes the book of Luke, and then he writes Acts, volume one, volume two. And they are volume one and volume two. He takes, Luke takes it right up to Pentecost, right up to the ascension of Jesus Christ, takes it up to the ascension of Christ, picks the ascension of Jesus Christ up in Acts 1. If you read Luke 24, you'll see that's where he left it. He picks it back up in Acts 1 like a good writer. And when he gets to verse 2, he called the Feast of Weeks Pentecost. Now, look what he said. Look, look, look at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had come, nobody called it that. It was called the Feast of Wigs. Now, look, here's what you're missing. This occurs, Acts 2 1 occurs in 30. At the actual occurrence of it. Hooking on, hooking up to Luke, the end of Luke. But when, but when Luke wrote Acts 2, see, Pentecost, the, uh, the Pentecost after the re resurrection of Christ was in 30 AD. But when Luke wrote Acts 2, we are in 61 AD. Now, you get that? We are 30 years deep into the church age. The church that began at Pentecost when Christ was seated at the right hand of God the Father and established the first thing he did was establish Pentecost, the church, the body of Christ. And it became a doctrinal term. Pentecost became a doctrinal term to teach that very principle. By the time we get to 61 AD, the Feast of Weeks is now gone and it's been replaced with the doctrine of Pentecost. The doctrine I'm teaching you today. See, all this is missed because people don't want to study. They don't want to study. They're like... They're, they're like concrete, you know. They're all mixed up and permanently set. They, they don't want to study. They got their view and they don't want to change. Listen, you have to change with the Word of God. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? And you better study it. I'm not asking what you think the Bible says. What does the Bible say to change your thinking? And when the day of Pentecost had come, <laughs> if you need more evidence than this, that the church began at Pentecost, listen to, as I carry on with you in this study. Point number three. The Feast of Weeks was also known as the Feast of Harvest in Exodus 23, 16. It is also de declared that in Levit in uh, Deuteronomy 16, 9, and 10, which I've written on the top of your page if you typed it out. If not, go to doctrinalstudies.com, pull it down, and read it. Here's what he says. You will count seven weeks for yourself. You shall begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. You know what that is? That's first fruits and the waving of the sheaf. Then you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of free will offering of your hand, which you shall give just as the Lord your God blessed you. Feast of Weeks, that's, you count, that's the Feast of Weeks. You count them off seven and you get to the 50th. The Feast of Harvest began with the first fruit waving of the chef, sheaf, the, which was the resurrection, ascension, and session of Jesus Christ. It was completed with Jesus set down the right hand of God the Father when he instituted Pentecost. 
Oh, I hope you get that. Listen, you'll have to study this a couple times. You'll have to study this a couple times. And what was the, what was the harvest, uh, what was the, the uh, feast of harvest? It was what call, was called the in gathering. It was the completion of the harvest season. It was all gathered up and ready for a new season. That's the church age. The feast of harvest. We live in the feast of harvest. I'm a product of that harvest. Because somebody shared the gospel with me. And I believed. And now have become a sharer of the gospel with others. Just like you should be. Now here's point four. Here's point four. At Pentecost in Acts 2.1. Jesus baptized, the believers gathered, and him seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Jesus baptized, believers gathered at the last feast of weeks, now called the Feast of Pentecost, with the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptized those people with the Holy Spirit, and they became the body of Christ in the world. And if you begin to read the book of Acts, you will see that there's going to be four more Pentecost. And they're going to follow the order of Acts 1.8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And it's about establishing the body of Christ, the church. That's the book of Acts. How about that? Here's where it all began in prophecy. It began with John the Baptist, the prophet sent from God. 400 years Israel has been without a prophet to the nation. He sends John the Baptist to announce the coming of Christ. Here's what John said in John, Matthew, the third chapter, verse 11. As for me, John the Baptist, I baptize you with water for repentance to change your mind about who is the Savior and how you're saved. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, Messiah, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He, not the Holy Spirit, will baptize you, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's got to baptize with the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit can baptize you. This is separate from that. There's Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit, and then later there's the Holy Spirit baptizing believers, those who believe. Now, I know. I know. That's because you don't study the Bible. I've never heard this before. I know. I hear it all the time. I don't know why you haven't, because it's, it's very plainly taught in the Word of God. If you solid, follow the Messiah, if you follow the teachings of the Messiah, here it is, Acts 1, 4, and 5. Acts 4 and 1. He's just about to ascend to the Father. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. Why? We got Pentecost yet. But to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. In other words, Jesus has been teaching a lot about it. Oh, yeah, John 14, 15, and 16. John, the seventh chapter. He taught about it. But prior to that, John has been teaching it. Which you heard from me. 
For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Watch this now. Not many days from now. When did he say that? His feet were on earth. He leaves on the 40th day. That's at Acts 1. He leaves, verse 3, he leaves on the 40th day. He goes back, is coronated with all authority in heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father with all authority. Getting ready for Pentecost, the first official act. Getting ready for Pentecost. Getting ready for Pentecost. Do you know what Pentecost means in the church? It means Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, the doctrine of Pentecost today means that Jesus baptized the believers at Pentecost, Feast of the Weeks, and rolled all that up into the church. And once the church is all rolled up, now the Holy Spirit puts them in. Listen, if, if Jesus Christ is required to die for your sins, then he's required in his first official act, seated at the right hand of God the Father to establish the church in the world, and he did that at Pentecost, we know that clearly. That, that's not even up for debate. Church didn't begin with Paul, it began with Jesus. Paul ain't the head of the church. My, 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 where do you get all that foolishness? Who's the head of the church? My, my, my. My, my, my. What happens when you don't study the Bible? You read commentaries. When you got the best one in the whole world, read it for yourself under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let him teach and recall. Not many days is 10. We know that. Because Pentecost, Jesus went back on the 40th, and we still got 10 more days to Pentecost. And something big is going to happen at Pentecost. How do I know it? Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem. Something big is coming your way. Not many days from now, so hold tight. If there was ever a group that had to be told to stay in their place and be quiet, it was his disciples. How about Acts, the second chapter, 32, 33, and then you can read later, 38, 39. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured forth both that which you have seen and heard. You know what that is? That's Pentecost. And what is Pentecost? It is Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit, as John said he would. As Jesus himself said he would. How about this? See, all I'm doing is reading the Bible. I haven't, I haven't quoted any commentaries. Did you notice that? I only have one. That's the Word of God. But here's one, Acts 11. See, I'm still in the book of Acts. Acts 11, 16 and 17. And I remember, this is Peter. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptizes with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them, Gentiles, Acts 11, the same gift as he gave to us, the Jews at Pentecost, also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I should stand in God's way? I mean, Acts 11. And God has said the doors open to Gentiles equally in Christ. Now, wait a minute. When was the book of Acts written? Not when it was lived. When was it written? 61 A.D. Do you understand his argument? I'm making the same argument in 2020. Nothing's changed. Just the time. 
You get all this? Are you getting it? And that's why, that's why we print all of this, and we're going to send you all this. All you got to do is print it out. Because you're going to have to study this stuff. You're going to have to study it. The advent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was a special teachings of Jesus during his 40 days of post-resurrection appearances. Which is pointed out by Luke in Luke 24, 44 through 49. In verse 49, I, I'm not going to read the whole thing because you can read. But in verse 49, he said to behold, this is Jesus talking with a couple of disciples. You might walk down the road to a man's. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. What was the promise of the Father? That Jesus would baptize at Pentecost, at the Feast of the Weeks. He would, he would baptize the believers and form the church, the body of Christ. Ah. Hmm. I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city, Terry, in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. What is that? Jesus baptized him with the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about it in John 14, 15, and 16. Please read those three chapters. This is not going to be a death sentence for you to read three chapters and look for the teachings that Jesus is giving on the Holy Spirit that will come at Pentecost. Don't be lazy. You ought, to, you ought to have a desire to know what does the Bible say for my life. Here's one, Galatians, the third chapter, 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Deuteronomy 21, 23, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Who hung on a tree? Who hung on a tree? that could deliver, redeem me, or deliver me from the curse of the law. The curse of the law. Jesus Christ. Now listen to what he says. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might be extended to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, let me close. By telling you this. There is no doubt that there is a clear distinction between Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, establishing the Pentecostal experience of being incorporated into the body of Christ, from the Holy Spirit baptizing you into Christ. First, Jesus must baptize with the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ and into his body. There are two completely different ideas. Two completely different ideas. Next week, when we come back, unless the Lord changes my message, I'm going to close this whole thing up by going back and showing you a clear distinction between Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit, forming, forming the body of Christ in the world as an event, and the Holy Spirit baptizing each believer into Christ and into that body. Because it is at Pentecost that you have the advent or the coming of the Holy Spirit. You've got to read John between now, listen, between now and next time, read John 14, 15, and 16. Look for what Jesus like. Read John 14, 16, read John 14, 25, 26, 27. You've got to read those chapters. You've got to read the verses in there that talk about this. And I'll come back this week and I'll explain the distinct differences in this. Let us pray. Well, Father, we're thankful today for these that have attended with us. Uh, during our study of August, 
uh, the study of April, <laughs> the study of April, and uh, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it, abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. And we've seen him do it at Passover and unleavened bread, first fruits and Pentecost. We're so thankful for it, Father. I pray that we'd become students of the word of God. And how we approach our problems in our life and crisis that we have is what does the Bible say? What does God promise you? I love one of those promises. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day the Lord has made. I don't care what's in that day. This day has been made by the Lord. And whatever he's bundled up in it is good for me. Romans 8, 28. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us do what? Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Not from it, but in it. For in it is where all the dynamics of God working marvelously in our life occurs. I pray that upon you today in Jesus' name. Amen.